today um in this talk i am going to talk about machine learning best practices uh, to build secure and compliant ml ops uh, pipelines um um a quick introduction about myself before i dive in um i'm sai sharanyanala i go by sai it's just easier um and um a little bit about myself um i've i'm basically from india uh, southern part of india hyderabad um i've moved to the us to do my masters in computer science uh, that's where i have um picked up a bunch of courses where uh, i've I've, I was able to gain knowledge on advanced machine learning uh, and data science, and I work there as a graduate teaching assistant for MATLAB and data mining courses as well. Uh, that helped me uh, gain knowledge in this area. Uh, later, I've uh, I've joined American Express. Uh, this was my very first full time job, uh, where I worked as a data scientist there, and. Uh, this role was within uh, amex's consumer card portfolio like american express has consumer cards as well as uh, business cards and the role i was on was basically supporting um uh, consumer credit cards um so um so in this role my work was be, was to identify uh, card members for whom um you know a certain offer makes sense so it was around trying to predict uh, which machine learning model which 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 offer makes sense of for a certain for a certain customer um so it was all around customer targeting and um and and initially when i started off working on this project um uh, the way we were trying to uh, Get, send out marketing offers was was manual to some extent because uh, we were building machine learning models to predict the likelihood of a customer responding responding to a particular offer but then uh, when we were sharing the customer list with the predictions um, to our marketing partners it was a manual list so there were um, so we were going through a few manual processes in between um later um my team have automated this entire system and that's where i was mainly introduced to uh, building the automation and the infrastructure around uh, setting up the mlops platforms in general so um at that time we were uh, built, we've built a response modeling framework which was hosting 86 different models where we were sending out uh, a bunch of different uh, offers starting from upgrades cross sells uh, to to a to 23 million customers uh, which were which were uh, the consumer base of amex at that point of time um and um, i was there for a couple of years and later have moved uh, uh, to aws uh, i was working at aws as a senior uh, ai ml consultant and uh, in aws uh, the team where i was on was sitting in the aws professional services group so this group was basically a team of consultants and we would work with uh, aws customers to either build pocs or production ready pipelines um and the customers i would interact with are uh, mainly with fall under finance and healthcare are uh, based and that's where i've gained a lot of knowledge uh, from my past experience at amex as well as with the healthcare customers i've i've gained knowledge around compliance and how 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 important is uh, risk management and compliance in regulated industries and that is uh, that's the main crux of the stock as well um uh, moving on this month uh, probably it's been a month i've accepted um a, uh, a new role at nike as a principal data scientist um uh, and this role uh, within nike uh, you know there's the retail space which everybody is aware of uh, apart from that there's also the training apps which is the nike run club and the nike training club um and my role here is within uh, supporting the ai capabilities for these two apps it's a pretty exciting role uh, where my goal was to build models uh, that might motivate people to be more active and um, and make and make them work out um, and make sure uh, that they're more active and make work out as a habit um, but it's it's a pretty exciting role and and uh, we're really looking forward to um, working there um, moving on um, 
and in today today we are gonna uh, have like a 45 minutes talk, a discussion about um what is mlops what is the motivation and what are some of the important considerations especially for uh, in case a few folks are a part of regulated industries like finance healthcare mining where you know um, certain regulations have to be followed to put your models into production and finally i'm going to um, end this with a sample architecture design um, using aws and then it will be open for q and a uh, but meanwhile feel free to like chime in in case if you have any questions um, firstly what is mlops um, in my view mlops is something is everything that needed to be done from when we realized that a machine learning model predictions are valuable until the point where the predictions are actually used in the applications and everything that goes in between these two phases falls under uh, mlops processes and why is mlops uh, so important um, um, machine learning models only bring value when they are in production. And according to Gartner's research, um, they have done a research where, um, where they've tried to identify what percentage of uh, machine learning models actually move from pilot to production. Um, I'd like this session to be a little bit interactive. Uh, I'm just going to throw this out as a quiz question. Uh, can you guys probably guess uh, any percentage value uh, you think um, that these, uh, what percentage of these machine learning models uh, move from POC to production? Um, just probably just message in the chat. I'll just take a look at it. Wow, 5%, 15%. That's quite low. Uh, 30, 10, okay. Um, Okay, well, I'd say probably Macy. Macy uh, Chan was the one who's closest uh, to the actual number. Um, uh, so the answer is 50%. Uh, I'm so surprised that everyone thought it's, it, it's worse than that, but, uh, but the answer is 50%, which is, which is still quite less. Uh, and then there's another uh, quiz question, again, the same research by Gartner. Um, what do you think is the approximate timeline to move uh, the machine learning models from POC to production? Uh, this could be, you could talk about in terms of months or years or days or weeks. Uh, I'll see who has the closest answer. Okay. Did, did someone did someone google it uh, but yeah the answer is nine months uh, but uh, I, I think Alex as well as Duong I'm sorry if I've pronounced it wrong but uh, you have the right answer the answer is nine months um, which is again still quite a lot uh, for pushing the models into production it's like three quarters uh, worth of time um so before moving into the operational aspect of it, let's, let's dive into uh, the basics, which is what goes into a machine learning life cycle. Um, the usual, the initial phase is the scoping phase. This is where uh, the business, um, the business analysts, as well as uh, the subject matter experts and the product team come in, figure out, come up with a business use case. And the data scientists basically brainstorm and try to try to frame the problem as a data science problem. That's when, once the problem is identified, that's when the data scientists and the data engineers work together to build, to, to basically start collecting the data. Um, and um, yeah, start collecting the data, build, um, uh, prepare the data so that it's good to push into a model training and then the model development stage where uh, different models are, are, are experimented with, different versions are tried. And finally, a best model is identified, which is again, acceptable by the folks who are uh, from, by the folks who are the business stakeholders associated with the project. Um, and then once the final mod model is identified, uh, then the next phase is deploying that model into production. And once the model is in production, uh, then there goes the maintenance phase. 
um, where uh, the models need to be monitored and tracked over time. And um, and in general, uh, in general, like I've seen, I've I've worked being a consultant. I've worked with a bunch of customers, and I've realized uh, there are. MLOps is such a huge problem, and there are quite a lot of challenges uh, which goes into it. Um, the teams at Google uh, have been doing a lot of research in this area uh, on technical challenges that comes up uh, while building MLOps systems. In the NeurIPS paper, uh, which you see on the right, uh, on hidden technical death in ML systems uh, shows you that ML code is, is just only a very small fraction of the whole process. If you look at the figure on the left, uh, there's configurations, uh, there's data extraction, data collection process, then a bunch of tools to um, manage the models, to manage the process, and the data visualization tools, and then finally the serving, the serving layer and the monitoring layer. As you can see, this entire process is, com is complex, and the machine learning code is just a tiny bit of it, which you see in the middle. Um, and and then the next challenge is the skill gap. Um, so ML ops is a combination of building machine learning models, handling data throughout the entire machine learning life cycle, and um, building the infrastructure, the DevOps needed for maintaining the infrastructure for production. Um, as, as ML ops requires expertise in all these three different areas, multiple stakeholders are obviously involved. And and a lot of trust needs to be needs to be there between the different stakeholders because oftentimes in my experience i've seen data scientists usually do not have access to um, data in the production um, or uh, pushing the models into production often they partner with software engineers um, who have you know the production cluster access um, so so what so generally what happens is data science Obviously, software engineers are not data scientists. Um, so oftentimes, there's uh, th there needs to be trust maintained between between the two parties to ensure the models are accurately being transported uh, into the production layer as well. Um, and and that's and and in order in order for the entire MLOps system to be more accurate and efficient. And maintaining this is obviously a big a, a big challenge. And uh, the other challenge is um, the machine learning governance aspect of it, uh, which is um, there is a little regulation around the world today specifically aimed at AIML, although many existing regulations already have significant impact on ML governance. Um, this takes two forms. Uh, the first one is um, industry-specific regulations. Uh, for example, um, like it's 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 GXP, especially in the pharmaceutical background, um, and it's uh, model risk management regulations, uh, which falls under uh, the finance background, and um, and the other and the other type of regulations are um, are focused specifically around setting guidelines for collecting and processing personal data. Um, for example, the GDPR, which was set out by EU government, um, and uh, the CCPA, which was set out by California, California and in the US, are some, are some examples which are addressing data privacy related problems. Apart from these, um, there has been a lot of buzz um, recently around AI specific regulations and, um, and European Commission, um, has launched a white paper to set out po policy options on trustworthy AI. And, um, and FDA has also recently launched, which is in October 2021, uh, an article around uh, good machine learning practices for, um, for, med for medical device development. Um, it's, uh, in, case, in case any of you are within these fields, please, uh, please check, check it out. Uh, it's, it's, it's very useful. Um, because these uh, guidelines have to be um, um, ha have to be have to be maintained to ensure that the models are successful. You could you could actually put those models into production uh, and successfully maintain them. Um, now let's dive a little bit deeper 
into uh, the technical aspects which go into an MLOps uh, workflow. This is again in line with the ML life cycle, which we have seen earlier. Um, the business, um, initially the, it starts off with uh, the business questions and, um, and, and making sure what the business need is. And, um, and once, the, uh, once the business need is translated into a, a machine learning problem, um, that's when the data scientists would, would start with like uh, getting the data, collecting the data, um, feature engineering, uh, preparing the data so that it's good to, to go back into a machine learning uh, training framework. And as we have realized that machine learning is obviously iterative, so there's a lot of back and forth between preparing the data and coming back to training the model um, and running multiple experiments. And, uh, and then the final phase would be um, to, to evaluate the model's performance against an out of time sample or a out of time or, as, or an out of a sample data set and evaluating how the model is performing there and then comparing similarly with the different versions you have created and picking out the best model. Um, once the best model is identified, the next step uh, would, be, would be done by, again, every organization is gonna be different. Um, Sometimes data scientists, sometimes data engineers, uh, uh, software engineers, or ML, or ML engineers work in this area where they try to define, um, set up processes for QA and risk evaluation and setting up the runtime environment. Most often DevOps engineers would then um, build the infrastructure so that um, they, they can, uh, they can make sure everything is microservices based so that it's reusable. Um, as and when, uh, as and when the data and machine learning ecosystem is scaled, um, the the uh, the containerized versions are, are, are can still be used, um, and um, and then often the, the other aspect is code versioning and setting up CI/CD pipelines uh, for smooth uh, for smoothly tracking across different environments. And once the model is in production. Then the next set of tasks is to make sure there are uh, there is there are systems to um, ensure logging and alerting is set up or uh, detecting drift, as well as uh, performing uh, on online evaluation um, or offline evaluation depending on the need. And as and when the new feedback new feedback comes in, um, then making sure there is a feedback loop. Um, to retrain the models and and um, and to ensure that the models are actually performing well uh, with with the newer data coming in, so these are in 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 general the aspects which go into an MLOps workflow. Um, um, the next the next topic is around what are the general considerations to build efficient uh, machine learning pipelines. Um, the first aspect I would say is maintaining the reproducibility in your pipeline. Um, unlike traditional software engineering, uh, machine learning is experimental, highly iterative, and consists of multiple phases that makes reproducibility challenging. Uh, it all starts with the data. It's important to ensure that the data set is reproducible at each and every phase um, in the ML lifecycle, um, which includes preparing the data, which is pre-processing, post-processing, um, and feature engineering aspect of things. But often, um, there exists a lot of variability uh, in the data, uh, especially, especially since, um, since th there is randomness involved in techniques like subsampling methods uh, for creating a trained test validation data splits, and also data sets shuffling might be another reason for variability. And and um, in general, the stochastic nature of the machine learning models itself make it really hard uh, for us to reproduce the results. Um, and there are certain techniques like temperature scaling um, um, and ensemble modeling to help you quantify uncertainty in model predictions. Um, apart from the data and model aspect, the hardware and software environment configurations and standardizing them also becomes important uh, when uh, the reproducibility aspect needs to be maintained throughout the pipeline. Um, uh, the next aspect is uh, maintaining traceability. 
Traceability can be maintained by continuously tracking and storing uh, the metadata associated with your data and model iterations. So this basically includes everything like which model, which modeling technique was used to build a model version, what train test validation data sets went into that particular model version, um, where is where is that data located currently? What is the location? Um, which uh, which model and what hyperparameters were actually used to train that particular model version? Um, and what was the performance results um, of that model? And is that model currently in production, or is it? Or is it? What version is it? Like all these metadata, uh, saving all this metadata is is becomes a really crucial step. Um, and apart from that, um, code code versioning and container versioning also becomes really important. There are certain services internally and outside of AWS. Um, like Amazon ECR, which is a container repository store. And for, um, for um, model management, the SageMaker model, mon uh, model registry, um, which helps with managing different model versions as well. And um, the, the next aspect is um, ensuring auditability. Um, um, this this can be achieved by continuously logging and monitoring. Um, in the previous step, we were talking about monitoring the data and the model results, but it also becomes essential uh, to monitor um, the account activity, the configurations of the underlying infrastructure and the resources. And um, there are services to help out with that. Um, AWS offers CloudTrail and Config to help out with that. And when when any certain certain potential security threat has been identified, uh, services like CloudWatch events can be used. Uh, which is it is event based. Um, whenever a certain event occurs, uh, this could this could trigger the next step, so that necessary action can be taken um, to mitigate a potential impact of a security incident. Um, uh, next um, next it also becomes really essential. Um, to encrypt uh, your data at rest and in transcript and, and in transit. Security is job zero. Um, so um, maintaining this, uh, maintaining and securing the data becomes a really important step. There are services like um, key management services, um, which uh, like Amazon KMS, um, which helps, which helps you uh, with this process. And um, the next, the next aspect is authentication and authorization. Um, you should configure permissions uh, in line with IAM uh, best practices as well as your internal company's best practices. But often setting up um, accesses in, in your environment, which are role-based controls, or by granting only the permissions required to perform a certain task, which is least privilege access, is, is recommended. Um, when um, when such infrastructure, a huge infrastructure is set up. Um, with the, um, and the next topic is bias detection. Uh, with the, um, with the emergence of responsible AI, detecting bias in our data sets has become a really, really crucial, um, uh, really crucial and um, just going by the definition of the word bias uh, in the dictionary, it, it means inclination towards, uh, to a, uh, inclination for or against one person or a group, especially in the way considered as unfair is called bias. Um, in the context of ML, uh, bias can be detected in the data the model is trained on, or it can exist in the labels, uh, it can be learned and it can be learned by the model. Here, I'm going to walk you through two types of biases. The first one is historical bias. Um, and here is an example. Um, uh, as you can see on the left, uh, it's a 2018 um, Thomson Reuters article published that um, Amazon scraped its AI recruiting tool uh, that was originally built uh, to filter out applicant resumes and spit out the top resumes. Uh, that was the original use case uh, for that tool. Although later uh, Amazon realized that its uh, its its new system was not uh, rating candidates for technical posts in a gender neutral way, uh, this is because uh, models were trained uh, to vet applicants by observing patterns in resumes um, 
that was submitted over 10 years, uh, over, over a 10 year period. And most often uh, from men, uh, which is a reflection of the male dominance uh, across the tech industry right now. Um, and um, the other type of bias uh, is the sampling bias. As you can see in the article on the right, um, this type of bias exists uh, when your data is not evenly distributed. Um, 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 this, is, uh, this is a New York Times article published in 2020. Uh, this article talks about a study that was published in Journal Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. Um, speech recognition systems uh, which were built uh, by the by the top tech companies like Amazon, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Apple, Google, IBM, and Microsoft uh, make far fewer errors with users who are white compared to the users who are black. This is essentially because the models were trained with um, with the sampled uh, with the uh, with, with the biased data set and hence and hence the problem. Um, detecting bias uh, and making sure there are measures in your uh, workflow to detect bias becomes really important. Um, the next aspect is interpretability. Uh, in in um, in the in, in interpretability is basically the degree to which a human can understand the cause of a decision. Um, in the ML sense, it is uh, trying to backtrack what factors have contributed to a machine learning model for making a certain prediction. Um, as you can see on the graph, which is towards the right, um, simpler models are easier to interpret, uh, but may often produce lower accuracy compared to complex models like neural network models that can understand uh, the nonlinear relationships in the data and often have higher accuracy. Um, in the industry currently, uh, interpretability and explainability are used interchangeably, and um, there's no specific definition assigned to these two terms. Although um, loosely defined, there are two types of explanations. Uh, one is global explanation, which is explaining on an overall model level uh, what features are more important. Uh, for example, in a finance setting uh, where the use case is to build machine learning models to identify customers who are most likely to do default, um, certain features like you know, credit score, uh, the number of cards that particular customer has, or the revolving balance, um, the amount of debt he has uh, would, would give away certain characteristics of the customer, and they might be more likely to default. Um, similarly, on a local level, um, uh, which are instance instance level explanations um, specific to a certain data point. Um, um, so for every prediction, what factors have actually contributed um, for making a certain decision is something which local explanations can help with. For example, in a sent sentiment um, classification problem um, for a movie review, uh, for a movie review, if somebody has given a review saying, I've never watched something as bad, um, the explainability model will try to um, uh, predict, uh, might predict that this, it's a negative sentiment, uh, but in order to understand what factors within that particular sentence have contributed for that uh, negative sentiment output, um, as you can see in the highlighted text, bad has the highest influence it's it's darker red shade compared to something although both these words have contributed for making that decision bad has a higher influence compared to something so these are the things which local interpretability techniques would help out again within um within amazon there's something called as amazon SageMaker um that can that can be used to uh, provide explanations um for tabular data for text data um as well um, and then the next topic is uh, monitoring and feedback loop. Uh, once machine learning models are deployed in production, monitoring these machine learning models in productions become a really crucial step. Uh, this is because we often have observed that um, the model's performance may degrade over time. Um, and the reason for it could be a shift in the data. Uh, this shift might occur because of seasonality effects or something like pandemic has happened or a consumer behavior might have changed. 
so mechanisms to identify drift, whether it's through data distribution or, uh, and if a model has degraded over time becomes essential. Um, then we think about the question around when should a model be retrained? Um, there is no one fit for all approach here. It is gonna depend on multiple factors like how often is uh, new data available? Or um, what are the cost, impl cost implications associated with it? Um, and um, is there a significant model performance improvement to consider uh, that particular model version? And, um, and then defining what a winning model looks like from your existing champion model, which you currently are using uh, versus the newly retrained challenger model and coming up with the criteria or metrics around how to choose a winner between a champion challenger uh, becomes essential. And often having human reviewers uh, in the loop uh, before uh, pushing the models into production becomes extremely essential. Uh, a lot of times um, when, when we are dealing with um, projects with huge sensitivity uh, where um, where um, where false negatives or false positives are 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 unacceptable and should be minimized as much as possible. That's when human in the loop uh, uh, component would become really really essential. And again, Amazon SageMaker model monitor um, has certain features that can help uh, keep your machine learning models accurate over time. Uh, these. These in general like wrap up all the different considerations that we need to make when designing your MLOps platform. Um, and in, in the next slide, um, yep, in, in, in the next slide, I'm, I'm, this basically shows a comprehensive list of uh, the machine learning services AWS has to offer. I'm not gonna go over each and every aspect of it, uh, but on a high level, uh, um, in the first stack under the AI services, um, so these services, uh, the features which under AI services are offered are mostly no code, low code based and are accessible to someone with little to no machine learning knowledge as well. Auto ML is also part of uh, the AI services that's available. And under machine learning services, uh, SageMaker offers um, starting from you know, setting up your notebooks to sharing those notebooks to uh, running experiments, uh, hosting models in real time or on the edge um, and capabilities to monitor your models um, with, uh, with support from wide range of infrastructure and frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, um, Keras and so on. Um, like um, AWS has a lot of services which can help out with your, with your MLOps journey. Um, now let's dive a little bit deeper into, um, into a reference MLOps architecture using specifically AWS. Um, as you can see on the left, um, which, is, um, which is the data selection and the management layer, uh, AWS has certain services like Glue, EMR, and SageMaker processing jobs that help you um, create data pipelines um, and run, run, run your Python Spark uh, Scala jobs to, um, to prepare your data sets. And the next, the next layer is the model training and the model tuning layer. Um, within SageMaker, there, is, there are SageMaker training jobs and there is like SageMaker experiments, which will help you build your models uh, build your custom models. Uh, use either in in uh, use either the algorithms that are currently available with AWS, or you can, as always, use custom algorithms which you have built, and you could wrap them around um, a container and use a SageMaker jobs to start running your training pipelines. And SageMaker has Sage um, hyper hyperparameter optimization um, as well um, for running hyperparameter tuning. And, um, and in order to save um, every different model version, there's a model registry available, which you can see on the right. Uh, the, mo 
model package groups and the model uh, SageMaker model registry can help out with setting up that infrastructure. And um, and once your model is developed, uh, then the next step would be how to host that model. And and in order to host the model, we need to identify whether we need the results in real time or we need the results in a batched format as and when as and when there's a need. Um, and um, once that is determined, um, then services like Amazon API Gateway can be used for hosting the model or, or for integrating for integrating with um, with any third party tools. Um, and for monitoring purposes, SageMaker uh, model monitor can be used. Uh, you, you should be able to schedule jobs. Uh, you should be able to store different model versions in S3 buckets and an, and an event-based setup could be scheduled using Amazon CloudWatch um, as well. And uh, finally, in order to interpret uh, the model results, uh, um, SageMaker Clarify can be used uh, for understanding why a model has made certain predictions probably looking at important features or probably looking at um, the highlighted words in a text to understand um, to understand the importance in terms of why a model has made a certain prediction. So all these aspects could be covered uh, by a lot of these features here. And again, there's, there's obviously an, a layer which connects all of these things, an orchestration layer. Here it's the SageMaker pipelines in this example. And then in order to build your CI CD pipelines, there's something called a code build and code pipeline to do that. And then something equivalent to GitHub is a, is a code commit repository uh, for uh, hosting all your, uh, for sharing all your code there and maintaining different versions. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's basically a high level reference architecture in case of somebody is interested um, to understand uh, what are the services and how to build an MLOps pipeline in AWS. And I'm so glad that there's another workshop, uh, which is specifically uh, showing on a, on a hands-on level, how to, um, how to run this on your own uh, using AWS. Um, so really looking forward to that. Um, but few other links which will help you get started um, in your MLOps journey. Uh, the Introducing MLOps book is, is a really helpful uh, one to get started. And um, while I was back at AWS, I published um, with my team uh, um, around machine learning best practices in healthcare and life sciences white paper. This paper will give you a lot of understanding around what are the considerations, especially in order to hit um, the uh, good machine learning practices, regulation, regulatory compliance uh, before putting your models into production. And, and another workshop link, uh, which is uh, around getting started with MLOps and Amazon SageMaker is another link that can help you out, get started uh, to learn more about AWS and SageMaker and kickstart your journey. Um, with that, uh, I am I'm done and I'm open to questions. And yeah, thank you, Sai, uh, for having a talk with us. And I think it's very informative. And I believe like nowadays, more and more projects are using machine learning models to solve their questions. So I believe it's essential for us to adapt to efficient tools and uh, discuss about the best practice for um, testing, deploying our models and Specifically, when you mentioned about um, the regulations and bias, I guess like in the near future, um, different parties parties will uh, have more focus on it because uh, like of the rap uh, technology development process. And yeah, maybe I can start from um, the most upvoted questions. We got a couple questions to mm -hmm. uh, from the audience. The first one is, um, you mentioned about risk evaluation elastic scale in ML ops workflow. Uh, can you do a little bit more like elaboration or maybe give an example on uh, how it works? Sure. Um, so elastic scaling uh, refers to, um, so once you set up an infrastructure, uh, you also need to make sure um, as and when because because uh, you're gonna set up, um, you should be good to set up a retraining pipeline, and the data 
comes in and every time the data size is going to increase and as and when the data size increases um, the infrastructure should be able to handle the requests as well let it be on the data side uh, which is um, probably if your data size has moved from certain gigabytes to petabytes um, or even terabytes um, this, the existing infrastructure or the tools which you have used uh, to uh, to build that infrastructure should be able to handle the scale um, so uh, thinking about the future, uh, thinking about um, how many requests you might get um, for this particular use case, uh, scaling becomes an important aspect while designing your uh, MLOps infrastructure. And uh, the other aspect is around risk evaluation. Um, so oftentimes um, what happens is every every use case, every industry has their, has their um, specific definition to um, what they're more careful about. Uh, say, for example, in a fraud detection use case, um, um, uh, um, it's, it's, it becomes really essential to identify uh, to identify for, uh, to identify customers who are uh, more um, prone to uh, performing fraud. So in that particular case, uh, uh, it, 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 it becomes essential to um, to identify folks with lesser probability of becoming fraud as uh, who might be fraudsters as well because because the op the cost of uh, not identifying a fraudster is much more than mistakenly identifying um, someone who is not doing fraud as as as, as doing a fraud um, so every risk evaluation is going to specifically depend on what the definition of risk for that particular use case is. Um, hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think I would basically uh, get the basic idea of that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the second question is about uh, with your experience in ML ops, do you have any advice for new data scientists or machine learning engineers to keep track with uh, new updates in the industry and continue continue uh, to improve their data science machine learning skills yeah sure um like i've um i think i think especially when when working for a particular enterprise or a company uh, uh the amount of um flexibility you get to choose the tools might be limited to some extent uh but oftentimes i've observed that um when when the tools you are currently using is gonna dip, is gonna depend on a lot of other factors like where is your data sitting what current infrastructure is the current team using like are we using data breaks are we using um, is our data currently in like an s3 bucket or are we using an azure infrastructure so oftentimes it becomes um, our decisioning around uh, what infrastructure to use what frameworks to use is going to depend upon these things and I've, I've also seen um, a number of startups uh, which have emerged recently, like um, and, and like Fiddler.ai is like one of my favorites. Um, so they've built they've built tools specifically focusing on like one section, like for MLOps, for or, or either focusing on model monitoring, focusing on the explainability aspect. Um, it depends on which particular stage or the phase at the ML life cycle you are interested in to pick out uh, and, and, and then researching around um, which, which tool is more versatile and which tool is more compatible with what infrastructure you currently have. It's, it's gonna be difficult to keep up or learn about a bunch of different things uh, or a bunch of different tools that are out there. Um, um, but I would say, but I've seen customers, I've, I've worked with customers who are on a hybrid cloud platform. They use Databricks for data, um, uh, for, um, uh, for, for running their notebooks, probably use um, SageMaker, for, uh, probably use SageMaker for building out machine learning pipelines um, and something else for, uh, for some other purpose, like open source tools for probably use GitHub. So it's usually... It's, it's usually a combination of multiple things, but there are some customers who are all in on a certain service and they prefer using uh, that particular service uh, throughout. So it really depends. And in case if there's an advantage of using one versus the other, um, 
um i think we should just go for that um but yeah so most of the time the tools it actually depends on uh like the company practice and uh for news because um i think the the audience is from like the questions is from a uh, new um data scientists and for them you would suggest them to mm -hmm like know the basic and then because uh, the choose is ultimately decided by the company and we uh, should have a certain um, ability to adapt them. So yes, essentially, because because if, if it's if it's for a smaller project, probably when uh, it, it's for our own personal project, probably something like weights and biases could be helpful or most of the time, uh, like AWS free tire version, you should be able to um, able to experiment with a bunch of different tools and test it out um, um and and since since i think while figuring out which services or tools to use making sure that the infrastructure you use is serverless so that you could you pay only for uh, the resources you have used uh, also becomes important um so yeah it's it, it's going to depend, but I would say uh, the, the the use in the useful link section, uh, the workshop, uh, which basically introduces to um, let me point it out. So this getting started with MLOps and Amazon SageMaker, I believe you should be good with testing this out on a free trial version on AWS console. Um, so something like this would be helpful for you to get started for someone new. Good. Um, our next question is about, um, are there any security risk in any part of the pipeline? And if yes, uh, how do companies tackle such risk? Yes. Um, so, um, so oftentimes like there are, uh, when you're say, for example, in AWS use in, in, in AWS, when somebody uses an S3 bucket, um, the bucket obviously uh, should be there are some a, a lot of privacy settings you, which you could set up uh, to ensure it's secure the data in it's is secure um, there is like key management service tools which we, which you can use for encrypting the data and um, and even even while um, not just while storing the data in s3 there are um, the, you could also um, attach security related um, configurations while running a training job or while running a certain um, certain task in SageMaker or uh, or in any other service within AWS um, so so that your so your data is like uh, secure in at rest uh, as well as in transit as well um, so um, I'm happy to like share the security best practices um, in, in in general, uh, but some using something like KMS keys would be uh, would be a good start. Um, our next question is, uh, what are some of the popular biases matrix you uh, used by the industry in a bias detection slide? So there's one slide you talk you mentioned about the bias. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it's a really popular matrix to like count or oh, um this maybe um this model or uh, the 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 model they have trained as bias I think that's the mm -hmm. yeah yeah um I think most often what I have observed was um so um in a bias detection of framework uh, the things um. It's, it becomes essential to um, to look at a bunch of different features, especially focusing um, focusing on um, diving deep into um, certain features like gender or um, or the race, and 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 trying to make sure like when you're training a model, how uh, how the data distribution is uh, across a bunch of these different features, and um, and setting up a baseline. Uh, around these features. So when a service like SageMaker model monitoring can be used or SageMaker Clarify is used, um, um, once once that threshold is hit, like the baseline threshold is hit, and and if if you're and, and probably the metrics which you're calculating is above that threshold, um, 
that's when you would like to take measures to um, so stop uh, the process and set up alerts so that the responsible parties are al al alerted. And um, the aspects which I've talked about, which is the, the traceability aspect. So if, if your pipeline is, is set up so that it's traceable, the folks who are responsible for understanding what, where, where has the, uh, where, where was the bias um, implication detected and which part of the data is responsible for, uh, you know, if it, it might be, it, 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 it may not be, it might be coming from a certain, a certain set of, um, a, a certain part of the application or, you know, there might be a number of reasons. So the traceability pipeline will help you figure out what exact data set went into this particular a version of the data uh, of the data where a bias was detected. And do you have any example for that? For example, in your experience in a uh, credit card um, like company, because um, from what I like, what I got is uh, you will monitor how the model is performing, like based on the result of the model and say, oh, um, it hits a certain threshold. So how do you um, like identify, okay, this is a threshold and this is some criteria that we would like to look into. Like if, if you have an example, it would be easier to understand. Yeah, sure. Um, so so in, um, I think probably just uh, talk about one experience which I've, uh, which I've set up initially was, um, so uh, when uh, probably when you're when you're basically starting off with your pipeline or started deploying the very first model or version into production that becomes your the model performance which you're getting let's say you're looking at f1 score and if f1 score you know there might be a bunch of different metrics for your specific use case if you think um, a combination of f1 score and recall is helpful just focus on that um, so first identifying which metrics is more important for you is step one. Step two is um, to use uh, the very first model's results as a baseline. Say if, you are, if your first model run which went into production is a model with F1 score of 0.8 and a recall of um, 0.7, um, then that would be like your baseline. And when your model is retrained again, and if you have if you have observed that uh, the model performance is better, like in terms of F1 score and recall, then you should be then that means that means your champion uh, your challenger model is good, and it's and it's well inclined with the newer um, real time data which is uh, which is coming in, so that can be pushed to production. But in certain cases where uh, the model performance is not going to be uh, good or at least similar to what what's currently in production. I think that's where alerts need to be set up um, to go back and review where the data is coming in, what uh, what has changed, because oftentimes um, it it may be it 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 may it you know seasonality effect could be one reason, uh, but oftentimes it could be also a change in the behavior. Sometimes it could be change in the application itself which might have caused those issues. So uh, relevant teams need to be notified um, around those changes um, and an investigation needs to be done in terms of what, what changed and why it changed. And if the reasons why it changed uh, is, is okay and acceptable, then that would become your new baseline. But if it's unacceptable, then, um, um, then identifying the root cause and rectifying that error in the data and, and refactoring that would be helpful. Uh, until then, whatever version is there in the production need to be continued. So I hope this example helps. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, like I, I, um, I think this like uh, cases like this. Uh, this your uh, you mentioned about the reposability, traceability, audibility will be will come in uh, handy on uh, detecting of the um, bias. And I think in the interest of time uh, comes to our last questions. So for beginners in ML ops, will you suggest any resources to understand the process better and get hands-on experience on um, the whole process? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say intro introducing the O'Reilly book 
on introducing MLOps is uh, is was very helpful for me. So I I'd recommend that. And um, to get started with AWS journey, probably MLOps on Amazon SageMaker would be helpful. Um, um, and there's also one other book, which is called Practical MLOps, which is again an O'Reilly book. Um, there, they've detailed in detail, it's very hands-on book. So they also talked about um, how to build an MLOps platform in Azure in GCP frameworks. If, um, if you're looking for a more hands-on one, I'd, I'd recommend a Practical um, MLOps book as well, which is again O'Reilly's. Yeah, I think uh, at one more point is that um, in the next sessions, we are going to have a workshop. <laughs> so it's a very yeah. great chance to have some hands-on practice on this as well. Yeah, we're going to do the ADMS. Yeah, I think um, the second talk sessions is uh, about time and thank you so much once again for Sai uh, for the talks and spend, spending extra time for us to uh, present it and talk to us today. Um, next, we will talk about creating an end-to-end -end, uh, pipeline in cloud uh, formations. Like I mentioned, it's a hands-on workshop. And let me share the screen because I have a GitHub link for you guys. Okay. So if you look at the screen now, okay. uh, you will see that I have a GitHub link there. Um, we are going to use the AWS platform to um, do the hands-on practice. And I recommend you to create an AWS S3 account before the start of the workshop. Um, if you encounter any questions, just um, ask one of our volunteers for help. And I think from now, um, our sessions will end uh, like the second sessions will end and I'll see you guys in uh, 11, 15. Uh, we have 10 minutes break and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, everyone.